Keynes Collection, Macroeconomics, Neoclassical Economic Theory, Business Cycles, and Government Intervention, the first works by Keynes entered the public domain in 2016, yet we continue to inhabit an era defined by modern monetary policy and governmental intervention. Macroeconomics, as a discipline, was fundamentally reinvented by Keynes, who emphatically endorsed the government's role amid a backdrop of imperialism and the rise of multinational corporations. This conceptual shift would eventually devolve into formal collaborations and alliances of corporate power and international interests. Consequently, the ruling establishment has incorporated agents of foreign lobbies and board members from various concerns. On the other side of the spectrum, grassroots opposition, often composed of self-identified libertarians, advocates for the disengagement from special interests. However, they often overlook the intricate, chimera-like relationship that the awakened behemoth of corporate power shares with the Leviathan of government, a symbiosis aimed at averting larger-scale conflicts. Historically, the disarmament of foreign rulers and march estates has never occurred without bloodshed. Let us momentarily revisit the libertarian utopia, a world before the advent of Keynesian economics. In this context, please give audience to my compendium of Keynesian macroeconomic theories, critiques, and policy advisories. The Consequences to the Banks of the Collapse of Money Values by John Maynard Keynes A year ago it was the failure of agriculture, mining, manufactures, and transport to make normal profits, and the unemployment and waste of productive resources ensuing on this, which was the leading feature of the economic situation. Today, in many parts of the world, it is the serious embarrassment of the banks which is the cause of our gravest concern. The shattering German crisis of July 1931, which took the world more by surprise than it should, was in its essence a banking crisis, though precipitated, no doubt, by political events and political fears. That the top-heavy position, which ultimately crumbled to the ground, should have been built up at all, was, in my judgment, a sin against the principles of sound banking. One watched its erection with amazement and terror, but the fact which was primarily responsible for bringing it down was a factor for which the individual bankers were not responsible and which very few people foresaw. Namely, the enormous change in the value of gold money and consequently in the burden of indebtedness which debtors, in all countries adhering to the gold standard, had contracted to pay in terms of gold. All this is familiar enough in general terms. We are also familiar with the idea that a change in the value of money can gravely upset the relative positions of those who possess claims to money and those who owe money. For, of course, a fall in prices, which is the same thing as a rise in the value of claims on money, means that real wealth is transferred from the debtor in favour of the creditor, so that a larger proportion of the real asset is represented by the claims of the depositor, and a smaller proportion belongs to the nominal owner of the asset who has borrowed in order to buy it. This, we all know, is one of the reasons why changes in prices are upsetting. But it is not to this familiar feature of falling prices that I wish to invite attention. It is to a further development which we can ordinarily afford to neglect, but which leaps to importance when the change in the value of money is very large, when it exceeds a more or less determinate amount. Modest fluctuations in the value of money, such as those which we have frequently experienced in the past, do not vitally concern the banks which have interposed their guarantee between the depositor and the debtor. For the banks allow beforehand for some measure of fluctuation in the value both of particular assets and of real assets in general, by requiring from the borrower what is conveniently called a margin. That is to say, they will only lend him money up to a certain proportion of the value of the asset, which is the security offered by the borrower to the lender. Experience has led to the fixing of conventional percentages for the margin as being reasonably safe in all ordinary circumstances. The amount will, of course, vary in different cases within wide limits. But for marketable assets, a margin of 20% to 30% is conventionally considered as adequate, and a margin of as much as 50% is highly conservative. Thus provided the amount of the downward change in the money value of assets is well within these conventional figures, the direct interest of the banks is not excessive. They owe money to their depositors on one side of their balance sheet and are owed it on the other, and it is no vital concern of theirs just what the money is worth. But consider what happens when the downward change in the money value of assets within a brief period of time exceeds the amount of the conventional margin over a large part of the assets against which money has been borrowed. The horrible possibilities to the banks are immediately obvious. Fortunately, this is a very rare, indeed a unique event, for it had never occurred in the modern history of the world prior to the year 1931. There have been large upward movements in the money value of assets in those countries where inflation has proceeded to great lengths. But this, however disastrous in other ways, 
did nothing to jeopardize the position of the banks, for it increased the amount of the margins. There was a large downward movement in the slump of 1921, but that was from an exceptionally high level of values which had rolled for only a few months or weeks, so that only a small proportion of the bank's loans had been based on such values and these values had not lasted long enough to be trusted. Never before has there been such a worldwide collapse over almost the whole field of the money values of real assets as we have experienced in the last two years. And, finally, during the last few months, so recently that the bankers themselves have, as yet, scarcely appreciated it, it has come to exceed in very many cases the amount of the conventional margins. In the language of the market, the margins have run off. The exact details of this are not likely to come to the notice of the outsider until some special event, perhaps some almost accidental event, occurs which brings the situation to a dangerous head. For, so long as a bank is in a position to wait quietly for better times and to ignore meanwhile the fact that the security against many of its loans is no longer as good as it was when the loans were first made, nothing appears on the surface and there is no cause for panic. Nevertheless, even at this stage the underlying position is likely to have a very adverse effect on new business. For the banks, being aware that many of their advances are in fact frozen and involve a larger latent risk than they would voluntarily carry, become particularly anxious that the remainder of their assets should be as liquid and as free from risk as it is possible to make them. This reacts in all sorts of silent and unobserved ways on new enterprise. For it means that the banks are less willing than they would normally be to finance any project which may involve a lockup of their resources. Now, in estimating the quantitative importance of the factor to which I am calling attention, we have to consider what has been happening to the prices of various types of property. There are, first of all, the principal raw materials and foodstuffs of international commerce. These are of great importance to the banks, because the stocks of these commodities, whether in warehouse or in transit or embodied in half-finished or unsold manufactured articles, are very largely financed through the banks. In the last 18 months, the prices of these commodities have fallen on the average by about 25%. But this is an average, and banks cannot average the security of one customer with that of another. Many individual commodities of the greatest commercial importance have fallen in price by 40 to 50 percent or even more. Next come the ordinary or common shares of the great companies and corporations which are the market leaders in the stock exchanges of the world. In most countries, the average fall amounts to 40 to 50 percent, and this again is an average which means that individual shares, even amongst those which would have been considered of good quality two years ago, have fallen enormously more. Then there are the bonds and the fixed interest securities. Those of the very highest grade have, indeed, risen slightly, or, at the worst, not fallen by more than 5%, which has been of material assistance in some quarters. But many other fixed interest securities, which, while not of the highest grade, were, and are, good securities, have fallen from 10 to 15%, whilst foreign government bonds have, as is well known, suffered prodigious falls. These declines, even where they are more moderate, may be scarcely less serious, because such bonds, though not in Great Britain, are often owned by the banks themselves outright, so that there is no margin to protect them from loss. The declines in the prices of commodities and of securities have, broadly speaking, affected most countries alike. When we come to the next category of property, and one of great quantitative importance, namely, real estate, the facts are more various as between one country and another. A great element of stability in Great Britain, and, I believe, in France also, has been the continued comparative firmness in real estate values. No slump has been experienced in this quarter, with the result that mortgage business is sound and the multitude of loans granted on the security of real estate are unimpaired. But in many other countries, the slump has affected this class of property also, and particularly, perhaps, in the United States, where farm values have suffered a great decline, and also city property of modern construction much of which would not fetch today more than 60-70% to 70 of its original cost of construction, and not infrequently much less. This is an immense aggravation of the problem, where it has occurred, both because of the very large sums involved and because such property is ordinarily regarded as relatively free from risk. Finally, there are the loans and advances which banks have made to their customers for the purposes of their customers' business. These are, in many cases, in the worst condition of all. The security in these cases is primarily the profit, actual and prospective, of the business which is being financed, and in present circumstances for many classes of producers of raw materials, of farmers and of manufacturers, there are no profits and every prospect of insolvencies if matters do not soon take a turn for the better. To sum up, there is scarcely any class of property, except real estate, however useful and important to the welfare of the community, the current money value of which has not suffered an enormous and scarcely precedented decline. This has happened in a community which is so organized that a veil of money is, as I have said, interposed over a wide field between the actual asset and the wealth owner. The ostensible proprietor of the actual asset has financed it by borrowing money from the actual owner of wealth. 
Furthermore, it is largely through the banking system that all this has been arranged. That is to say, the banks have, for a consideration, interposed their guarantee. They stand between the real borrower and the real lender. They have given their guarantee to the real lender, and this guarantee is only good if the money value of the asset belonging to the real borrower is worth the money which has been advanced on it. It is for this reason that a decline in money value so severe as that which we are now experiencing threatens the solidity of the whole financial structure. Banks and bankers are by nature blind. They have not seen what was coming. Some of them have even welcomed the fall of prices towards what, in their innocence, they have deemed the just and natural and inevitable level of pre-war, that is to say, to the level of prices to which their minds became accustomed in their formative years. In the United States, some of them employ so-called economists, who tell us even today that our troubles are due to the fact that the prices of some commodities and some services have not yet fallen enough, regardless of what should be the obvious fact that their cure, if it could be realized, would be a menace to the solvency of their institution. A sound banker, alas, is not one who foresees danger and avoids it, but one who, when he is ruined, is ruined in a conventional and orthodox way along with his fellows, so that no one can really blame him. But today they are beginning at last to take notice. In many countries, bankers are becoming unpleasantly aware of the fact that, when their customers' margins have run off, they are themselves on margin. I believe that, if today a really conservative valuation were made of all doubtful assets, quite a significant proportion of the banks of the world would be found to be insolvent, and with the further progress of deflation this proportion will grow rapidly. Fortunately, our own domestic British banks are probably at present, for various reasons, among the strongest. But there is a degree of deflation which no bank can stand. And over a great part of the world, and not least in the United States, the position of the banks, though partly concealed from the public eye, may be in fact the weakest element in the whole situation. It is obvious that the present trend of events cannot go much further without something breaking. If nothing is done, it will be amongst the world's banks that the really critical breakages will occur. Modern capitalism is faced, in my belief, with the choice between finding some way to increase money values towards their former figure, or seeing widespread insolvencies and defaults and the collapse of a large part of the financial structure, after which we should all start again, not nearly so much poorer as we should expect, and much more cheerful perhaps, but having suffered a period of waste and disturbance and social injustice, and a general rearrangement of private fortunes and the ownership of wealth. Individually many of us would be ruined, even though collectively we were much as before. But under the pressure of hardship and excitement, we might have found out better ways of managing our affairs. The present signs suggest that the bankers of the world are bent on suicide. At every stage they have been unwilling to adopt a sufficiently drastic remedy. And by now matters have been allowed to go so far that it has become extraordinarily difficult to find any way out. It is necessarily part of the business of a banker to maintain appearances and to profess a conventional respectability which is more than human. Lifelong practices of this kind make them the most romantic and the least realistic of men. It is so much their stock in trade that their position should not be questioned, that they do not even question it themselves until it is too late. Like the honest citizens they are, they feel a proper indignation at the perils of the wicked world in which they live, when the perils mature, but they do not foresee them. A banker's conspiracy. The idea is absurd. I only wish there were one. So, if they are saved, it will be, I expect, in their own despite. A Short View of Communist Russia by John Maynard Keynes, 1925 What is the communist faith? Leninism is a combination of two things which Europeans have kept for some centuries in different compartments of the soul, religion and business. We are shocked because the religion is new, and contemptuous because the business, being subordinated to the religion instead of the other way round, is highly inefficient. Like other new religions, Leninism derives its power not from the multitude but from a small minority of enthusiastic converts whose zeal and intolerance make each one the equal in strength of a hundred indifferentists. Like other new religions, it is led by those who can combine the new spirit, perhaps sincerely, with seeing a good deal more than their followers, politicians with at least an average dose of political cynicism, who can smile as well as frown, volatile experimentalists, released by religion from truth and mercy but not blinded to facts and expediency, and open therefore to the charge, superficial and useless though it is where politicians, lay or ecclesiastical, are concerned, of hypocrisy. Like other new religions, it seems to take the colour and gaiety and freedom out of everyday life and to offer a drab substitute in the square wooden faces of its devotees. Like other new religions, it persecutes without justice or pity those who actively resist it. Like other new religions, it is unscrupulous. Like other new religions, it is filled with missionary ardour and ecumenical ambitions. But to say that Leninism is the faith of a persecuting and propagating minority of fanatics led by hypocrites is, after all, to say no more nor less than that it is a religion and not merely a party, and Lenin a Mohammed, not a Bismarck. If we want to frighten ourselves in our capitalist easy chairs, 
We can picture the communists of Russia as though the early Christians led by Attila were using the equipment of the Holy Inquisition and the Jesuit missions to enforce the literal economics of the New Testament. But when we want to comfort ourselves in the same chairs, can we hopefully repeat that these economics are fortunately so contrary to human nature that they cannot finance either missionaries or armies and will surely end in defeat? There are three questions to answer. Is the new religion partly true or sympathetic to the souls of modern men? Is it on the material side so inefficient as to render it incapable to survive? Will it, in the course of time, with sufficient dilution and added impurity, catch the multitude? As for the first question, those who are completely satisfied by Christian capitalism or by egotistic capitalism untempered by subterfuge will not hesitate how to answer it, for they either have a religion or need none. But many, in this age without religion, are bound to feel a strong emotional curiosity towards any religion which is really new, and not merely a recrudescence of old ones, and has proved its motive force. And all the more when the new thing comes out of Russia, the beautiful and foolish youngest son of the European family, with hair on his head, nearer both to the earth and to heaven than his bald brothers in the West, who, having been born two centuries later, has been able to pick up the middle-aged disillusionment of the rest of the family before he has lost the genius of youth or become addicted to comfort and to habits. I sympathize with those who seek for something good in Soviet Russia. But when we come to the actual thing, what is one to say? For me, brought up in a free air undarkened by the horrors of religion, with nothing to be afraid of, Red Russia holds too much which is detestable. Comfort and habits let us be ready to forego, but I am not ready for a creed which does not care how much it destroys the liberty and security of daily life, which uses deliberately the weapons of persecution, destruction, and international strife. How can I admire a policy which finds a characteristic expression in spending millions to suborn spies in every family and group at home, and to stir up trouble abroad? Perhaps this is no worse and has more purpose than the greedy, warlike, and imperialist propensities of other governments, but it must be far better than these to shift me out of my rut. How can I accept a doctrine which sets up as its Bible, above and beyond criticism, an obsolete economic textbook which I know to be not only scientifically erroneous but without interest or application for the modern world? How can I adopt a creed which, preferring the mud to the fish, exhausts the boorish proletariat above the bourgeois and the intelligentsia who, with whatever faults, are the quality in life and surely carry the seeds of all human advancement? Even if we need a religion, how can we find it in the turbid rubbish of the red bookshops? It is hard for an educated, decent, intelligent son of Western Europe to find his ideals here, unless he has first suffered some strange and horrid process of conversion which has changed all his values. Yet we shall miss the essence of the new religion if we stop at this point. The communist may justly reply that all these things belong not to his ultimate faith, but to the tactics of revolution. For he believes in two things, the introduction of a new order upon earth, and the method of the revolution as the only means thereto. The new order must not be judged either by the horrors of the revolution or by the privations of the transitionary period. The revolution is to be a supreme example of the means justified by the end. The soldier of the revolution must crucify his own human nature, becoming unscrupulous and ruthless, and suffering himself a life without security or joy, but as the means to his purpose and not its end. What, then, is the essence of the new religion as a new order upon earth? Looking from outside, I do not clearly know. Sometimes its mouthpieces speak as though it was purely materialistic and technical in just the same sense that modern capitalism is, as though, that is to say, communism merely claimed to be in the long run a superior technical instrument for obtaining the same materialistic economic benefits as capitalism offers, that in time it will cause the fields to yield more and the forces of nature to be more straightly harnessed. In this case there is no religion after all, nothing but a bluff to facilitate a change to what may or may not be a better economic technique. But I suspect that, in fact, such talk is largely a reaction against the charges of economic inefficiency which we on our side launch, and that at the heart of Russian communism there is something else of more concern to mankind. In one respect communism but follows other famous religions. It exalts the common man and makes him everything. Here there is nothing new. But there is another factor in it which also is not new but which may, nevertheless, in a changed form and a new setting, contribute something to the true religion of the future, if there be any true religion. Leninism is absolutely, definedly non-supernatural, and its emotional and ethical essence centers about the individual's and the community's attitude towards the love of money. I do not mean that Russian communism alters, or even seeks to alter, human nature, that it makes Jews less avaricious or Russians less extravagant than they were before. I do not merely mean that it sets up a new ideal. I mean that it tries to construct a framework of society in which pecuniary motives as influencing actions shall have a changed relative importance, in which social approbation shall be differently distributed, and where behaviour, which previously was normal and respectable, ceases to be either the one or the other. 
In England today, a talented and virtuous youth, about to enter the world, will balance the advantages of entering the civil service and of seeking a fortune in business, and public opinion will esteem him not less if he prefers the second. Money-making, as such, on as large a scale as possible, is not less respectable socially, perhaps more so, than a life devoted to the service of the state or of religion, education, learning, or art. But in the Russia of the future, it is intended that the career of money-making, as such, will simply not occur to a respectable young man as a possible opening, any more than the career of a gentleman burglar or requiring skill in forgery and embezzlement. Even the most admirable aspects of the love of money in our existing society, such as thrift and saving, and the attainment of financial security and independence for oneself and one's family, whilst not deemed morally wrong, will be rendered so difficult and impracticable as to be not worthwhile. Everyone should work for the community, the new creed runs, and, if he does his duty, the community will uphold him. This system does not mean a complete levelling down of incomes, at least at the present stage. A clever and successful person in Soviet Russia has a bigger income and a better time than other people. The commissar with five pounds a week, plus sundry free services, a motor car, a flat, a box at the ballet, etc., etc., lives well enough, but not in the least like a rich man in London. The successful professor or civil servant with six pounds or seven pounds a week, minus sundry impositions, has, perhaps, a real income three times those of the proletarian workers and six times those of the poorer peasants. Some peasants are three or four times richer than others. A man who is out of work receives part pay, not full pay. But no one can afford on these incomes, with high Russian prices and stiff progressive taxes, to save anything worth saving. It is hard enough to live day by day. The progressive taxation and the mode of assessing rents and other charges are such that it is actually disadvantageous to have an acknowledged income exceeding £8 to £10 a week. Nor is there any possibility of large gains except by taking the same sort of risks as attached to bribery and embezzlement elsewhere. Not that bribery and embezzlement have disappeared in Russia or even rare, but anyone whose extravagance or whose instincts drive him to such courses runs serious risk of detection and penalties which include death. Nor, at the present stage, does the system involve the actual prohibition of buying and selling at a profit. The policy is not to forbid these professions, but to render them precarious and disgraceful. The private trader is a sort of permitted outlaw, without privileges or protection, like the Jew in the Middle Ages, an outlet for those who have overwhelming instincts in this direction, but not a natural or agreeable job for the normal man. The effect of these social changes has been, I think, to make a real change in the predominant attitude towards money, and will probably make a far greater change when a new generation has grown up which has known nothing else. People in Russia, if only because of their poverty, are very greedy for money, at least as greedy as elsewhere. But money-making and money-accumulating cannot enter into the life calculations of a rational man who accepts the Soviet rule in the way in which they enter into ours. A society of which this is even partially true is a tremendous innovation. Now all this may prove utopian or destructive of true welfare, though, perhaps, not so utopian, pursued in an intense religious spirit, as it would be if it were pursued in a matter-of-fact way. But is it appropriate to assume, as most of us have assumed hitherto, that it is insincere or wicked? Communism's power to survive. Can communism in the course of time, with sufficient dilution and added impurity, catch the multitude? I cannot answer what only time will show, but I feel confident of one conclusion that if communism achieves a certain success, it will achieve it, not as an improved economic technique, but as a religion. The tendency of our conventional criticisms is to make two opposed mistakes. We hate communism so much, regarded as a religion, that we exaggerate its economic inefficiency, and we are so much impressed by its economic inefficiency that we underestimate it as a religion. On the economic side, I cannot perceive that Russian communism has made any contribution to our economic problems of intellectual interest or scientific value. I do not think that it contains, or is likely to contain, any piece of useful economic technique which we could not apply, if we chose, with equal or greater success in a society which retained all the marks, I will not say of 19th century individualistic capitalism, but of British bourgeois ideals. Theoretically, at least, I do not believe that there is any economic improvement for which revolution is a necessary instrument. On the other hand, we have everything to lose by the methods of violent change. In Western industrial conditions, the tactics of Red Revolution would throw the whole population into a pit of poverty and death. But as a religion, what are its forces? Perhaps they are considerable. The exaltation of the common man is a dogma which has caught the multitude before now. Any religion and the bond which unites co-religionists have power against the egotistic atomism of the irreligious. For modern capitalism is absolutely irreligious, without internal union, without much public spirit, often, though not always, a mere congeries of possessors and pursuers. Such a system has to be immensely, not merely moderately, successful to survive. In the 19th century it was in a certain sense idealistic, 
At any rate, it was a united and self-confident system. It was not only immensely successful, but held out hopes of a continuing crescendo of prospective successes. Today, it is only moderately successful. If irreligious capitalism is ultimately to defeat religious communism, it is not enough that it should be economically more efficient, it must be many times as efficient. We used to believe that modern capitalism was capable, not merely of maintaining the existing standards of life, but of leading us gradually into an economic paradise where we should be comparatively free from economic cares. Now we doubt whether the businessman is leading us to a destination far better than our present place. Regarded as a means, he is tolerable. Regarded as an end, he is not so satisfactory. One begins to wonder whether the material advantages of keeping business and religion in different compartments are sufficient to balance the moral disadvantages. The Protestant and Puritan could separate them comfortably because the first activity pertained to earth and the second to heaven, which was elsewhere. The believer in progress could separate them comfortably because he regarded the first as the means to the establishment of heaven upon earth hereafter. But there is a third state of mind, in which we do not fully believe either in a heaven which is elsewhere or in progress as a sure means towards a heaven upon earth hereafter, and if heaven is not elsewhere and not hereafter, it must be here and now or not at all. If there is no moral objective in economic progress, then it follows that we must not sacrifice, even for a day, moral to material advantage, in other words, that we may no longer keep business and religion in separate compartments of the soul. In so far as a man's thoughts are capable of straying along these paths, he will be ready to search with curiosity for something at the heart of communism quite different from the picture of its outward parts which our press paints. At any rate to me it seems clearer every day that the moral problem of our age is concerned with the love of money, with the habitual appeal to the money motive in nine-tenths of the activities of life, with the universal striving after individual economic security as the prime object of endeavour, with the social approbation of money as the measure of constructive success, and with the social appeal to the hoarding instinct as the foundation of the necessary provision for the family and for the future. The decaying religions around us, which have less and less interest for most people unless it be as an agreeable form of magical ceremonial or of social observance, have lost their moral significance just because, unlike some of their earlier versions, they do not touch in the least degree on these essential matters. A revolution in our ways of thinking and feeling about money may become the growing purpose of contemporary embodiments of the ideal. Perhaps, therefore, Russian communism does represent the first confused stirrings of the great religion. On art treasures in Soviet Russia, writes thus of his departure out of the country. Dot, dot, dot. After a very long halt, the train moved on about half a mile to the Finnish frontier, where passports, visas, and luggage were again examined much less meticulously. The station was new-built, a pleasant place, simple, clean, and convenient, and served with much courtesy. It has a charming refreshment room, where simple but nicely cooked food was supplied in an atmosphere of hospitality. It seems a churlish thing for me to say, after all the kindness shown to me in Russia, but if I am to tell the whole truth I must here put on record that in this frontier station of Finland I experienced a sense out of the removal of a great weight which had been oppressing me. I cannot explain just how this weight had been felt. I did not experience the imposition of it on entering Russia, but as the days passed it seemed slowly to accumulate. The sense of freedom gradually disappeared. Though everyone was kind, one felt the presence of an oppression, not on oneself, but all pervading. Never have I felt so completely a stranger in a strange land. With successive days what at first was a dim feeling took more definite shape and condensed into an ever-increasingly conscious oppression. I imagine one might have passed through the same experience in the Russia of the Tsars. Americans often praise what they call the air of liberty, which they claim is characteristic of their country. They possess it in common with all the English-speaking dominions. The moral atmosphere of Russia is a very different compound of emotional chemistry. The part of Finland through which our train now bore us was not different in physical character from the lands across the frontier, but we found ourselves passing nice little properties and the signs of comfort and even prosperity. Dot, dot, dot. The mood of oppression could not be better conveyed. In part, no doubt, it is the fruit of Red Revolution. There is much in Russia to make one pray that one's own country may achieve its goal not in that way. In part, perhaps, it is the fruit of some beastliness in the Russian nature, or in the Russian and Jewish natures when, as now, they are allied together. But in part it is one face of the superb earnestness of Red Russia, of a high seriousness, which in its other aspect appears as the spirit of elation. There never was any one so serious as the Russian of the Revolution, serious even in his gaiety and abandon of spirit, so serious that sometimes he can forget tomorrow and sometimes he can forget today. Often this seriousness is crude and stupid and boring in the extreme. The average communist is discoloured just as the Methodists of every age have been. The tenseness of the atmosphere is more than one is used to support, and the longing comes for the frivolous ease of London. Yet the elation, when that is felt, is very great. 
Here, one feels at moments, in spite of poverty, stupidity and oppression, is the laboratory of life. Here the chemicals are being mixed in new combinations and stink and explode. Something, there is just a chance, might come out. And even a chance gives to what is happening in Russia more importance than what is happening, let us say, in the United States of America. I think that it is partly reasonable to be afraid of Russia, like the gentleman who writes to the Times. But if Russia is going to be a force in the outside world, it will not be the result of Mr. Zinoviev's money. Russia will never matter seriously to the rest of us, unless it be as a moral force. So, now the deeds are done and there is no going back, I should like to give Russia her chance, to help and not to hinder. For how much rather, even after allowing for everything, if I were a Russian, would I contribute my quota of activity to Soviet Russia than to Tsarist Russia? I could not subscribe to the new official faith any more than to the old. I should detest the actions of the new tyrants not less than those of the old. But I should feel that my eyes were turned towards, and no longer away from, the possibilities of things, that out of the cruelty and stupidity of old Russia nothing could ever emerge, but that beneath the cruelty and stupidity of new Russia some speck of the ideal may lie hid. After a long debate with Zinoviev, two communist Ironsides who attended him stepped forward to speak to me a last word with the full faith of fanaticism in their eyes. We make you a prophecy, they said. Ten years hence the level of life in Russia will be higher than it was before the war, and in the rest of Europe it will be lower than it was before the war. Having regard to the natural wealth of Russia and to the inefficiency of the old regime, having regard also to the problems of Western Europe and our apparent inability to handle them, can we feel confident that the comrades will not prove right? Liberalism and Labour by John Maynard Keynes, 1926 I do not wish to live under a conservative government for the next 20 years. I believe that the progressive forces of the country are hopelessly divided between the Liberal Party and the Labour Party. I do not believe that the Liberal Party will win one third of the seats in the House of Commons in any probable or foreseeable circumstances. Unless in course of time the mistakes of the Conservative government produce an economic catastrophe, which is not impossible, I do not believe that the Labour Party will win one half of the seats in the House of Commons. Yet it is not desirable that the Labour Party should depend for their chances of office on the occurrence of a national misfortune for this will only strengthen the influence of the party of catastrophe which is already an important element in their ranks. As things are now, we have nothing to look forward to except a continuance of conservative governments, not merely until they have made mistakes in the tolerable degree which would have caused a swing of the pendulum in former days, but until their mistakes have mounted up to the height of a disaster. I do not like this choice of alternatives. That is the practical political problem which confronts all those, in whichever party they are ranged, who want to see progressive principles put into effect, and believe that too long a delay in doing so may find the country confronted with extreme alternatives. The conventional retort by Labour orators is to call upon Liberals to close down their own party and to come over. Now it is evident that the virtual extinction of the Liberal Party is a practical possibility to be reckoned with. A time may come when anyone in active politics will have only two choices before him and not three. But I believe that it would be bad politics and bad behaviour to promote this end, and that it is good politics and good behaviour to resist it. Good politics to resist it, because the progressive cause in the constituencies would be weakened, and not strengthened, by the disappearance of the Liberal Party. There are many sections of the country, and many classes of voters, which for many years to come will never vote Labour in numbers, or with enthusiasm, sufficient for victory, but which will readily vote Liberal as soon as the weather changes. Labour leaders who deny this are not looking at the facts of politics with unclouded eyes. Good behaviour to resist it, because most present-day active Liberals, whilst ready on occasion to vote Labour and to act with Labour, would not feel comfortable, or sincere, or in place, as full members of the Labour Party. Take my own case. I am sure that I am less conservative in my inclinations than the average Labour voter. I fancy that I have played in my mind with the possibilities of greater social changes than come within the present philosophies of, let us say, Mr Sidney Webb, Mr Thomas, or Mr Wheatley. The republic of my imagination lies on the extreme left of celestial space. Yet, all the same, I feel that my true home, so long as they offer a roof and a floor, is still with the liberals. Why, though fallen upon such evil days, does the tradition of liberalism hold so much attraction? The Labour Party contains three elements. There are the trade unionists, once the oppressed, now the tyrants, whose selfish and sectional pretensions need to be bravely opposed. There are the advocates of the methods of violence and sudden change, by an abuse of language called communists, who are committed by their creed to produce evil that good may come, and, since they dare not concoct disaster openly, are forced to play with plot and subterfuge. There are the socialists, who believe that the economic foundations of modern society are evil, yet might be good. The company and conversation of this third element, whom I have called socialists, many liberals today would not find uncongenial. 
but we cannot march with them until we know along what path, and towards what goal, they mean to move. I do not believe that their historic creed of state socialism, and its newer gloss of guild socialism, now interest them much more than they interest us. These doctrines no longer inspire anyone. Constructive thinkers in the Labour Party and constructive thinkers in the Liberal Party are trying to replace them with something better and more serviceable. The notions on both sides are a bit foggy as yet, but there is much sympathy between them and a similar tendency of ideas. I believe that the two sections will become more and more friends and colleagues in construction as time goes on. But the progressive liberal has this great advantage. He can work out his policies without having to do lip service to trade unionist tyrannies, to the beauties of the class war, or to doctrinaire state socialism, in none of which he believes. In the realm of practical politics, two things must happen, both of which are likely. There must be one more general election to disillusion Labour optimists as to the measure of their political strength, standing by themselves. But equally on our side, there must be a certain change. The Liberal Party is divided between those who, if the choice be forced upon them, would vote Conservative, and those who, in the same circumstances, would vote Labour. Historically, and on grounds of past service, each section has an equal claim to call itself Liberal. Nevertheless, I think that it would be for the health of the party if all those who believe, with Mr Winston Churchill and Sir Alfred Mond, that the coming political struggle is best described as capitalism versus socialism, and, thinking in these terms, mean to die in the last ditch for capitalism, were to leave us. The brains and character of the Conservative Party have always been recruited from Liberals, and we must not grudge them the excellent material with which, in accordance with our historic mission, we are now preserving them from intellectual starvation. It is much better that the Conservative Party should be run by honest and intelligent ex-Liberals, who have grown too old and tough for us, than by die-hards. Possibly the Liberal Party cannot serve the state in any better way than by supplying Conservative governments with cabinets, and Labour governments with ideas. At any rate, I sympathise with Labour in rejecting the idea of cooperation with a party which included, until the other day, Mr Churchill and Sir Alfred Mond, and still contained several of the same kidney. But this difficulty is rapidly solving itself. When it is solved, the relations between Liberalism and Labour, at Westminster and in the constituencies, will, without any compacts, bargains, or formalities, become much more nearly what some of us would like them to be. It is right and proper that the Conservative Party should be recruited from the Liberals of the previous generation. But there is no place in the world for a Liberal Party which is merely the home of out-of-date or watery Labour men. The Liberal Party should be not less progressive than Labour, not less open to new ideas, not behind-hand in constructing the new world. I do not believe that liberalism will ever again be a great party machine in the way in which conservatism and labour are great party machines. But it may play, nevertheless, the predominant part in moulding the future. Great changes will not be carried out except with the active aid of labour. But they will not be sound or enduring unless they have first satisfied the criticism and precaution of liberals. A certain coolness of temper, such as all Oxford has, seems to me at the same time peculiarly liberal in flavour and also a much bolder and more desirable and more valuable political possession and endowment than sentimental ardours. The political problem of mankind is to combine three things, economic efficiency, social justice, and individual liberty. The first needs criticism, precaution, and technical knowledge. The second, an unselfish and enthusiastic spirit which loves the ordinary man. The third, tolerance, breadth, appreciation of the excellencies of variety and independence, which prefers, above everything, to give unhindered opportunity to the exceptional and to the aspiring. The second ingredient is the best possession of the great party of the proletariat. But the first and third require the qualities of the party which, by its traditions and ancient sympathies, has been the home of economic individualism and social liberty. Am I a liberal? If one is born a political animal, it is most uncomfortable not to belong to a party, cold and lonely and futile it is. If your party is strong, and its programme and its philosophy sympathetic, satisfying the gregarious, practical, and intellectual instincts all at the same time, how very agreeable that must be. Worth a large subscription and all one's spare time, that is, if you are a political animal. So the political animal who cannot bring himself to utter the contemptible words, I am no party man, would almost rather belong to any party than to none. If he cannot find a home by the principle of attraction, he must find one by the principle of repulsion and go to those whom he dislikes least, rather than stay out in the cold. Now take my own case, where am I landed on this negative test? How can I bring myself to be a conservative? They offer me neither food nor drink, neither intellectual nor spiritual consolation. I should not be amused or excited or edified. That which is common to the atmosphere, the mentality, the view of life of, well, I will not mention names, promotes neither my self-interest nor the public good. It leads nowhere, it satisfies no ideal. 
it conforms to no intellectual standard, it is not even safe or calculated to preserve from spoilers the degree of civilization which we have already attained. Ought I, then, to join the Labour Party? Superficially, that is more attractive. But looked at closer, there are great difficulties. To begin with, it is a class party, and the class is not my class. If I am going to pursue sectional interests at all, I shall pursue my own. When it comes to the class struggle as such, my local and personal patriotisms, like those of everyone else, except certain unpleasant zealous ones, are attached to my own surroundings. I can be influenced by what seems to me to be justice and good sense, but the class war will find me on the side of the educated bourgeoisie. But, above all, I do not believe that the intellectual elements in the Labour Party will ever exercise adequate control. Too much will always be decided by those who do not know at all what they are talking about, and if, which is not unlikely, the control of the party is seized by an autocratic inner ring, this control will be exercised in the interests of the extreme left wing, the section of the Labour Party which I shall designate the party of catastrophe. On the negative test, I incline to believe that the Liberal Party is still the best instrument of future progress, if only it had strong leadership and the right programme. But when we come to consider the problem of party positively, by reference to what attracts rather than to what repels, the aspect is dismal in every party alike, whether we put our hopes in measures or in men. And the reason is the same in each case. The historic party questions of the 19th century are as dead as last week's mutton, and whilst the questions of the future are looming up, they have not yet become party questions, and they cut across the old party lines. Civil and religious liberty, the franchise, the Irish question, dominion self-government, the power of the House of Lords, steeply graduated taxation of incomes and of fortunes, the lavish use of the public revenues for social reform, that is to say, social insurance for sickness, unemployment and old age, education, housing and public health, all these causes for which the Liberal Party fought are successfully achieved or are obsolete or are the common ground of all parties alike. What remains? Some will say, the land question. Not I, for I believe that this question, in its traditional form, has now become, by reason of a silent change in the facts, of very slight political importance. I see only two planks of the historic Liberal platform still seaworthy, the drink question and free trade. And of these two free trade survives, as a great and living political issue, by an accident. There were always two arguments for free trade, the laissez-faire argument which appealed and still appeals to the liberal individualists, and the economic argument based on the benefits which flow from each country's employing its resources where it has a comparative advantage. I no longer believe in the political philosophy which the doctrine of free trade adorned. I believe in free trade because, in the long run and in general, it is the only policy which is technically sound and intellectually tight. I must not stay for an answer, but must hasten to the largest of all political questions, which are also those on which I am most qualified to speak, the economic questions. An eminent American economist, Professor Commons, who has been one of the first to recognize the nature of the economic transition amidst the early stages of which we are now living, distinguishes three epochs, three economic orders, upon the third of which we are entering. The first is the era of scarcity, whether due to inefficiency or to violence, war, custom, or superstition. In such a period, there is the minimum of individual liberty and the maximum of communistic, feudalistic or governmental control through physical coercion. This was, with brief intervals in exceptional cases, the normal economic state of the world up to, say, the 15th or 16th century. Next comes the era of abundance. In a period of extreme abundance, there is the maximum of individual liberty, the minimum of coercive control through government, and individual bargaining takes the place of rationing. During the 17th and 18th centuries, we fought our way out of the bondage of scarcity into the free air of abundance, and in the 19th century, this epoch culminated gloriously in the victories of laissez-faire and historic liberalism. It is not surprising or discreditable that the veterans of the party cast backward glances on that easier age. But we are now entering on a third era, which Professor Commons calls the period of stabilization, and truly characterizes as the actual alternative to Marxist communism. In this period, he says, there is a diminution of individual liberty, enforced in part by governmental sanctions, but mainly by economic sanctions through concerted action, whether secret, semi-open, open, or arbitrational, of associations, corporations, unions, and other collective movements of manufacturers, merchants, labourers, farmers, and bankers. The abuses of this epoch in the realms of government are fascism on the one side and Bolshevism on the other. Socialism offers no middle course, because it also is sprung from the presuppositions of the era of abundance, just as much as laissez-faire individualism and the free play of economic forces, before which latter, almost alone amongst men, the city editors, all bloody and blindfolded, still piteously bow down. The transition from economic anarchy to a regime which deliberately aims at controlling and directing economic forces in the interests of social justice and social stability will present enormous difficulties both technical and political. 
I suggest, nevertheless, that the true destiny of new liberalism is to seek their solution. It happens that we have before us, today, in the position of the coal industry, an object lesson of the results of the confusion of ideas which now prevails. On the one side, the Treasury and the Bank of England are pursuing an orthodox 19th century policy based on the assumption that economic adjustments can and ought to be brought about by the free play of the forces of supply and demand. The Treasury and the Bank of England still believe, or, at any rate, did until a week or two ago, that the things which would follow on the assumption of free competition and the mobility of capital and labour actually occur in the economic life of today. On the other side, not only the facts, but public opinion also, have moved a long distance away in the direction of Professor Commons's epoch of stabilisation. The trade unions are strong enough to interfere with the free play of the forces of supply and demand, and public opinion, albeit with a grumble and with more than a suspicion that the trade unions are growing dangerous, supports the trade unions in their main contention that coal miners ought not to be the victims of cruel economic forces which they never set in motion. The idea of the old world party, that you can, for example, alter the value of money and then leave the consequential adjustments to be brought about by the forces of supply and demand, belongs to the days of 50 or 100 years ago when trade unions were powerless, and when the economic juggernaut was allowed to crash along the highway of progress without obstruction and even with applause. Half the copybook wisdom of our statesmen is based on assumptions which were at one time true, or partly true, but are now less and less true day by day. We have to invent new wisdom for a new age, and in the meantime we must, if we are to do any good, appear unorthodox, troublesome, dangerous, disobedient to them that begat us. In the economic field this means, first of all, that we must find new policies and new instruments to adapt and control the working of economic forces, so that they do not intolerably interfere with contemporary ideas as to what is fit and proper in the interests of social stability and social justice. It is not an accident that the opening stage of this political struggle, which will last long and take many different forms, should centre about monetary policy. For the most violent interferences with stability and with justice, to which the 19th century submitted in due satisfaction of the philosophy of abundance, were precisely those which were brought about by changes in the price level. But the consequences of these changes, particularly when the authorities endeavour to impose them on us in a stronger dose than even the 19th century ever swallowed, are intolerable to modern ideas and to modern institutions. We have changed, by insensible degrees, our philosophy of economic life, our notions of what is reasonable and what is tolerable, and we have done this without changing our technique or our copybook maxims. Hence our tears and troubles. A party program must be developed in its details, day by day, under the pressure and the stimulus of actual events. It is useless to define it beforehand, except in the most general terms. But if the Liberal Party is to recover its forces, it must have an attitude, a philosophy, a direction. I have endeavoured to indicate my own attitude to politics, and I leave it to others to answer, in the light of what I have said, the question with which I began. Am I a Liberal? We have seen in the preceding section the extent to which a government can make use of currency inflation for the purpose of securing income to meet its outgoings. But there is a second way in which inflation helps a government to make both ends meet, namely by reducing the burden of its pre-existing liabilities in so far as they have been fixed in terms of money. These liabilities consist, in the main, of the internal debt. Every step of depreciation obviously means a reduction in the real claims of the rentes holders against their government. It would be too cynical to suppose that, in order to secure the advantages discussed in this section, governments, except, possibly, the Russian government, depreciate their currencies on purpose. As a rule, they are, or consider themselves to be, driven to it by their necessities. The requirements of the Treasury to meet sudden exceptional outgoings, for a war or to pay the consequences of defeat, are likely to be the original occasion of, at least temporary, inflation. But the most cogent reason for permanent depreciation, that is to say devaluation, or the policy of fixing the value of the currency permanently at the low level to which a temporary emergency has driven it, is generally to be found in the fact that a restoration of the currency to its former value would raise the recurrent annual burden of the fixed charges of the national debt to an insupportable level. There is, nevertheless, an alternative to devaluation in such cases, provided the opponents of devaluation are prepared to face it in time which they generally are not, namely a capital levy. The purpose of this section is to bring out clearly the alternative character of these two methods of moderating the claims of the rentier when the state's contractual liabilities, fixed in terms of money, have reached an excessive proportion of the national income. The active and working elements in no community, ancient or modern, will consent to hand over to the rentier or bond-holding class more than a certain proportion of the fruits of their work. When the piled-up debt demands more than a tolerable proportion, Relief has usually been sought in one or other of two out of the three possible methods. The first is repudiation, 
But, except as the accompaniment of revolution, this method is too crude, too deliberate, and too obvious in its incidence. The victims are immediately aware and cry out too loud, so that, in the absence of revolution, this solution may be ruled out at present, as regards internal debt in Western Europe. The second method is currency depreciation, which becomes devaluation when it is fixed and confirmed by law. In the countries of Europe lately belligerent, this expedient has been adopted already on a scale which reduces the real burden of the debt by from 50 to 100 percent. In Germany, the national debt has been by these means practically obliterated, and the bondholders have lost everything. In France, the real burden of the debt is less than a third of what it would be if the franc stood at par, and in Italy only a quarter. The owners of small savings suffer quietly, as experience shows, these enormous depredations, when they would have thrown down a government which had taken from them a fraction of the amount by more deliberate but juster instruments. This fact, however, can scarcely justify such an expedient on its merits. Its indirect evils are many. Instead of dividing the burden between all classes of wealth owners according to a graduated scale, it throws the whole burden onto the owners of fixed interest bearing stocks, lets off the entrepreneur capitalist and even enriches him, and hits small savings equally with great fortunes. It follows the line of least resistance, and responsibility cannot be brought home to individuals. It is, so to speak, nature's remedy, which comes into silent operation when the body politic has shrunk from curing itself. The remaining, the scientific, expedient, the capital levy, has never yet been tried on a large scale, and perhaps it never will be. It is the rational, the deliberate method, but it is difficult to explain, and it provokes violent prejudice by coming into conflict with the deep instincts by which the love of money protects itself. Unless the patient understands and approves its purpose, he will not submit to so severe a surgical operation. Once currency depreciation has done its work, I should not advocate the unwise, and probably impracticable, policy of retracing the path with the aid of a capital levy. But if it has become clear that the claims of the bondholder are more than the taxpayer can support, and if there is still time to choose between the policies of a levy and of further depreciation, the levy must surely be preferred on grounds both of expediency and of justice. It is an overwhelming objection to the method of currency depreciation, as compared with that of the levy, that it falls entirely upon persons whose wealth is in the form of claims to legal tender money, and that these are generally, amongst the capitalists, the poorer capitalists. It is entirely ungraduated, it falls on small savings just as hardly as on big ones, and incidentally it benefits the capitalist entrepreneur class for the reasons explained in chapter 1. Unfortunately, the small savers who have most to lose by currency depreciation are precisely the sort of conservative people who are most alarmed by a capital levy, whilst, on the other hand, the entrepreneur class must obviously prefer depreciation which does not hit them very much and may actually enrich them. It is the combination of these two forces which will generally bring it about that a country will prefer the inequitable and disastrous courses of currency depreciation to the scientific deliberation of a levy. There is a respectable and influential body of opinion which, repudiating with vehemence the adoption of either expedient, fulminates alike against devaluations and levies on the ground that they infringe the untouchable sacredness of contract, or rather of vested interest, for an alteration of the legal tender and the imposition of a tax on property are neither of them in the least illegal or even contrary to precedent. Yet such persons, by overlooking one of the greatest of all social principles, namely the fundamental distinction between the right of the individual to repudiate contract and the right of the state to control vested interest, are the worst enemies of what they seek to preserve. For nothing can preserve the integrity of contract between individuals, except a discretionary authority in the state to revise what has become intolerable. The powers of uninterrupted usury are too great. If the accretions of vested interest were to grow without mitigation for many generations, half the population would be no better than slaves to the other half. Nor can the fact that in time of war it is easier for the state to borrow than to tax be allowed permanently to enslave the taxpayer to the bondholder. Those who insist that in these matters the state is in exactly the same position as the individual will, if they have their way, render impossible the continuance of an individualist society, which depends for its existence on moderation. These conclusions might be deemed obvious if experience did not show that many conservative bankers regard it as more consonant with their cloth, and also as economizing thought, to shift public discussion of financial topics off the logical onto an alleged moral claim, which means a realm of thought where vested interest can be triumphant over the common good without further debate. But it makes them untrustworthy guides in a perilous age of transition,
The state must never neglect the importance of so acting in ordinary matters as to promote certainty and security in business. But when great decisions are to be made, the state is a sovereign body of which the purpose is to promote the greatest good of the whole. When, therefore, we enter the realm of state action, everything is to be considered and weighed on its merits. Changes in death duties, income tax, land tenure, licensing, game laws, church establishment, feudal rights, slavery, and so on through all ages, have received the same denunciations from the absolutists of contract, who are the real parents of revolution. In our own country, the question of the capital levy depends for its answer on whether the great increase in the claims of the bondholder, arising out of the fact that it was easier, and perhaps more expedient, to raise a large part of the current costs of the war by loans rather than by taxes, is more than the taxpayer can be required, in the long run, to support. The high levels of the death duties and of the income and super taxes on unearned income, by which the net return to the bondholder is substantially diminished, modify the case. Nevertheless, immediately after the war, when it seemed that the normal budget could scarcely be balanced without a level of taxation of which a tax on earned income at a standard rate between sixes and tens, in the pound would be typical, a levy seemed to be necessary. At the present time the case is rather more doubtful. It is not yet possible to know how the normal budget will work out, and much depends on the level at which sterling prices are stabilised. If the level of sterling prices is materially lowered, whether in pursuance of a policy of restoring the old gold parity or for any other reason, a levy may be required. If, however, sterling prices are stabilised somewhere between 80 and 100% above the pre-war level, a settlement probably desirable on other grounds, and if the progressive prosperity of the country is restored, then perhaps we may balance our future budgets without oppressive taxation on earned income and without a levy either. A levy is from the practical view perfectly feasible, and is not open to more objection than any other new tax of like magnitude. Nevertheless, like all new taxes, it cannot be brought in without friction, and is, therefore, scarcely worth advocating for its own sake merely in substitution for an existing tax of similar incidence. It is to be regarded as the fairest and most expedient method of adjusting the burden of taxation between past accumulations and the fruits of present efforts, whenever, in the general judgment of the country, the discouragement to the latter is excessive. A levy is to be judged, not by itself, but as against the practicable alternatives. Experience shows with great certainty that the active part of the community will not submit in the long run to pay too much to vested interest, and, if the necessary adjustment is not made in one way, it will be made in another, probably by the depreciation of the currency. In several countries the existing burden of the internal debt renders devaluation inevitable and certain sooner or later. It will be sufficient to illustrate the case by reference to the situation of France, the home of absolutism of all kinds, and hence, sooner or later, of bouleversement. The finances of Humpty Dumpty are as follows. At the end of 1922 the internal debt of France, excluding altogether her external debt, exceeded 250 million francs. Further borrowing budgeted for in the ensuing period, together with loans on reconstruction account guaranteed by the government, may bring this total to the neighbourhood of 300 milliards by the end of 1923. The service of this debt will absorb nearly 18 milliards per annum. The total normal receipts under the provisional budget for 1923 are estimated at around 23 milliards. That is to say, the service of the debt will shortly absorb, at the value of the franc current early in 1923, almost the entire yield of taxation. Since other government expenditure in the ordinary budget, i.e., excluding war pensions and future expenditure on reconstruction, cannot be put below 12 milliards a year, it follows that, even on the improbable hypothesis that further expenditure in the extraordinary budget after 1923 will be paid for by Germany, the yield of taxation must be increased permanently by 30% to make both ends meet. If, however, the franc were to depreciate to, say, 100 to the pound sterling, the ordinary budget could be balanced by taking little more of the real income of the country than in 1922. In these circumstances it will be difficult, if not impossible, to avoid the subtle assistance of a further depreciation. What, then, is to be said of those who still discuss seriously the project of restoring the franc to its former parity? In such an event the already intolerable burden of the rentier's claims would be about trebled. It is unthinkable that the French taxpayer would submit. Even if the franc were put back to par by a miracle, it could not stay there. Fresh inflation due to the inadequacy of tax receipts must drive it anew on its downward course. Yet I have assumed the cancellation of the whole of France's external debt, 
and the assumption by Germany of the burdens of the extraordinary budget after 1923, an assumption which is not justified by present expectations. These facts alone render it certain that the franc cannot be restored to its former value. France must come in due course to some compromise between increasing taxation and diminishing expenditure and reducing what they owe their rentiers. I have not much doubt that the French public, as they have hitherto, will consider a further dose of depreciation, attributing it to the bad will of Germany or to financial Machiavellism in London and New York, as far more conservative, orthodox, and in the interest of small savers than a justly constructed capital levy, the odium of which could be less easily escaped by the French Ministry of Finance. If we look ahead, averting our eyes from the ups and downs which can make and unmake fortunes in the meantime, the level of the franc is going to be settled in the long run not by speculation or the balance of trade, or even the outcome of the Ruhr adventure, but by the proportion of his earned income which the French taxpayer will permit to be taken from him to pay the claims of the French rentier. The level of the franc exchange will continue to fall until the commodity value of the francs due to the rentier has fallen to a proportion of the national income, which accords with the habits and mentality of the country. In the grand discourse of economic stability, we often find ourselves at a crossroads between two distinct yet inextricably linked concepts, the stability of prices within our borders versus the stability of our currency in the global exchange. It is a matter of profound consideration that these two, while ideally synchronous, are often at variance due to external pressures beyond our dominion. Reflecting upon the times before the Great War, our choice as a nation, much like many of our contemporaries, leaned heavily in favour of maintaining a stable exchange rate. We were tethered to the gold standard, a system that, despite its rigidity, provided a sense of security and predictability. This preference was not without consequence, for it meant that we were subject to the whims of international gold markets and foreign banking policies, influences that could shift our domestic price levels without notice or mercy. Yet, we adhered to this system partly because the oscillations in prices we experienced were within bounds of moderation, and partly because we were hesitant to trust our economic fates to more deliberate but untested policies. Amidst this backdrop, notable voices arose championing the opposite cause, none more vocally than Professor Irving Fisher with his proposal for a compensated dollar. His ideas, radical as they were, pointed towards prioritizing internal price stability over exchange rate stability, unless, of course, all nations could simultaneously adopt such a policy. The question of which path to choose, stability of prices or stability of exchange, is not one to be answered with a sweeping generalization. It varies from nation to nation, contingent upon the relative importance of foreign trade to each country's economic fabric. However, I posit that there is a compelling argument for most to favor price stability. After all, the societal contracts and the continuum of business rely more heavily on a stable internal price mechanism than on the external value of our currency. Yet, it is worth acknowledging that exchange stability, while arguably less fundamental, is simpler to achieve, for it merely requires a uniform standard of value both domestically and internationally. Take, for example, the recent case of India, a nation that, whether by design or serendipity, managed to maintain a relatively stable level of internal prices at the cost of allowing its exchange rate to fluctuate. The criticisms levied against the government of India's financial manoeuvres during the period of 1920 and the subsequent drop in 1921 seemed to overlook the benefits of shielding the domestic economy from the extreme volatilities of the world market. Thus, the choice is not merely a technical one of economic management, but a profound judgment call that weighs the societal benefits of price stability against the commercial conveniences of exchange stability. In the pre-war gold standard era, the mechanism to balance international payments was slow and often ineffectual in the face of large or rapid shifts between internal and external price levels. Conversely, the post-war regime has presented a scenario where exchange rates are highly sensitive, leading to swift adjustments but also allowing for transient influences to cause undue disturbances. Our experience with the pre-war method shows that the central reserves and discount policies played a significant role in regulating the balance, but these measures often took time and could be influenced by international capital flows. The post-war system, on the other hand, has introduced an immediacy to the adjustment process, allowing for a rapid response to discrepancies in international payments, although at the risk of volatility due to ephemeral factors. It is imperative to appreciate the different roles played by discount policy under each regime. In the pre-war setup, it was central to equilibrium restoration, whereas in the post-war reality, exchange rate fluctuations alone can achieve this balance, 
albeit with the discount policy still available as a tool for influencing internal price levels. Inflation and Deflation by John Maynard Keynes 1919 Lenin is said to have declared that the best way to destroy the capitalist system was to debauch the currency. By a continuing process of inflation, governments can confiscate, secretly and unobserved, an important part of the wealth of their citizens. By this method they not only confiscate, but they confiscate arbitrarily, and, while the process impoverishes many, it actually enriches some. The sight of this arbitrary rearrangement of riches strikes not only at security, but at confidence in the equity of the existing distribution of wealth. Those to whom the system brings windfalls, beyond their deserts and even beyond their expectations or desires, become profiteers, who are the object of the hatred of the bourgeoisie, whom the inflationism has impoverished, not less than of the proletariat. As the inflation proceeds and the real value of the currency fluctuates wildly from month to month, all permanent relations between debtors and creditors, which form the ultimate foundation of capitalism, become so utterly disordered as to be almost meaningless, and the process of wealth getting degenerates into a gamble and a lottery. Lenin was certainly right. There is no subtler, no surer means of overturning the existing basis of society than to debauch the currency. The process engages all the hidden forces of economic law on the side of destruction, and does it in a manner which not one man in a million is able to diagnose. In the latter stages of the war, all the belligerent governments practice, from necessity or incompetence, what a Bolshevist might have done from design. Even now, when the war is over, most of them continue out of weakness the same malpractices. But further, the governments of Europe, being many of them at this moment reckless in their methods as well as weak, seek to direct onto a class known as profiteers the popular indignation against the more obvious consequences of the vicious methods. These profiteers are, broadly speaking, the entrepreneur class of capitalists, that is to say, the active and constructive element in the whole capitalist society, who in a period of rapidly rising prices cannot but get rich quick whether they wish it or desire it or not. If prices are continually rising, every trader who has purchased for stock or owns property and plant inevitably makes profits. By directing hatred against this class, therefore, the European governments are carrying a step further the fatal process which the subtle mind of Lenin had consciously conceived. The profiteers are a consequence and not a cause of rising prices. By combining a popular hatred of the class of entrepreneurs with the blow already given to social security by the violent and arbitrary disturbance of contract and of the established equilibrium of wealth which is the inevitable result of inflation, these governments are fast rendering impossible a continuance of the social and economic order of the 19th century. But they have no plan for replacing it. We see, therefore, that rising prices and falling prices each have the characteristic disadvantage. The inflation which causes the former means injustice to individuals and to classes, particularly to rentiers, and is therefore unfavourable to saving. The deflation which causes falling prices means impoverishment to labour and to enterprise by leading entrepreneurs to restrict production in their endeavour to avoid loss to themselves, and is therefore disastrous to employment. The counterparts are, of course, also true, namely that deflation means injustice to borrowers, and that inflation leads to the overstimulation of industrial activity. But these results are not so marked as those emphasised above, because borrowers are in a better position to protect themselves from the worst effects of deflation than lenders are to protect themselves from those of inflation, and because labour is in a better position to protect itself from overexertion in good times than from underemployment in bad times. Thus inflation is unjust and deflation is inexpedient. Of the two perhaps deflation is, if we rule out exaggerated inflation such as that of Germany, the worst, because it is worse, in an impoverished world, to provoke unemployment than to disappoint the rentier but it is not necessary that we should weigh one evil against the other. It is easier to agree that both are evils to be shunned. The individualistic capitalism of today, precisely because it entrusts saving to the individual investor and production to the individual employer, presumes a stable measuring rod of value, and cannot be efficient, perhaps cannot survive, without one. For these grave causes we must free ourselves from the deep distrust which exists against allowing the regulation of the standard of value to be the subject of deliberate decision. We can no longer afford to leave it in the category of which the distinguishing characteristics are possessed in different degrees by the weather, the birth rate, and the constitution, matters which are settled by natural causes, or are the resultant of the separate action of many individuals acting independently, or require a revolution to change them. <clears throat> Until our narratives intertwine once more, I remain Tim, wishing you insightful journeys. Brace for tomorrow, for with it comes another chapter in the annals of Truce Live Peace and the Reactionaries. Farewell until we reconvene.